me just begin with asking, have you had a good time in the Manning Conference? Yeah. Awesome. Then let's be, let me begin at this closing session by saying a sincere word of gratitude to all of the volunteers, organizers, and sponsors who uh, put this weekend together. They spent all year getting ready to bring people in from all across the country to talk about the future of our country. And uh, we owe such a debt of gratitude to the vision of the man who really ultimately is responsible, uh, my former leader, the Honorable Preston Manning. I'll never forget, uh, being a young lad, I grew up in southern Saskatchewan in a small uh, prairie town called Wilcox, and uh, one night in, uh, in mid-January, there was a huge blizzard out, uh, and I'd heard that Preston Manning was going to be speaking uh, in a town not far from there called Weyburn, which, by the way, is the town that Tommy Douglas used to represent as an MLA in the Saskatchewan legislature. So we made our way out, to my, my dad and I actually, to uh, uh, this uh, high school arena. In the middle of January, it was a blizzard. It was 35 below out. In other words, a, a warm day for a Saskatchewan winter. <laughs> and uh, when we got there, you, could hardly, you couldn't find a parking spot. There were hundreds of pickup trucks and people had bought, brought their trucks in from all around southern Saskatchewan. Uh, in the middle of a blizzard, I see roads, but they took the risk to hear this man and his voice of common sense that was challenging the political establishment at the time. And I'll never forget sitting in that room, listening to Preston uh, develop an argument about constitutional and fiscal reform, saying things that hadn't been said in Canadian politics before or not for a very long time. And I saw him speak up to the audience, not down to the audience, getting into the guts and details of our constitutional history and uh, the nature of our federation, saying things about fiscal responsibility that nobody in elected office had had the courage to say. And to this day, I will never forget looking around me and seeing these uh, hardworking women and men, farmers and small business people, teachers and nurses, in that cold winter night, listening to the power of ideas and the power of idealism because Preston didn't present a conventional political wisdom. He challenged people to think about real change. That's a tradition of reform conservatism, as I call it, that he continues through uh, these open discussions that we have at the Manning Conference. So I'd like to once again salute him and all of his fellow uh, travelers for help, helping to make this possible. Now, friends, let me, um, let me tell you another story, just to move a little bit west of Saskatchewan uh, to the province uh, of Alberta. Well, actually, since I'm on the topic about his, the history of the prairies, there's a very interesting and cautionary tale for us. In 1944, uh, that same man I mentioned, that Weyburn MLA, Tommy Douglas, came to office as the CCF Premier of Saskatchewan, the precursor to the NDP riding a populist wave of discontent. And Tommy promised that he was going to stand up for the little man, the little guy, and, uh, and fight the big banks and big businesses. And so and that sounded very appealing to a lot of people who had just been through the Depression and the war and were looking for a champion. And so Tommy started by raising taxes on people who worked, especially the higher income earners, raising taxes on businesses and employers, imposing massive new regulations on them, and, uh, and then uh, changing the labor laws, and began nationalizing industries, expropriating companies and property, and changed the royalties for the oil and gas companies. Now at that time, in 1944, Saskatchewan, Regina, believe it or not, was the headquarters of Canada's nascent energy industry. And the population of Saskatchewan then was a million people, the population next door in Alberta was about a million people. But because of the changes that Tommy Douglas made, informed by, an, uh, I, I think, an uh, admirable sense of idealism and social generosity, there were real-world consequences. Because all of the energy companies picked up out of Regina, out of Saskatchewan, and moved to Calgary, uh, all of the, many of the major employers left the province. Many of the highest income earners did as well. And the wealth creating uh, engine of that, that province's economy began to disappear. 
Six decades later, after six decades of policies largely informed by that experiment, the province of Saskatchewan still had a population of a million people, and Alberta had a population of four million. One province, 400% growth, one province, six decades of economic, demographic and social stagnation. That is the difference that policy can make. That is the difference that politics makes. That is why ideas have consequences. It is why we must always be wary of the politics of envy that have informed uh, the CCF in those days and the NDP today and many on the Canadian left. These are good women and men, fellow Canadians who are every bit as patriotic as those of us in this room. And they happen to believe, like we do, in the importance of serving human dignity. But they think that they can do so not by focusing on creating wealth and opportunity through equality of opportunity, but rather through the politics of resentment by dragging down those who have succeeded in our society. And we as Conservatives believe that human dignity can best be served by unleashing the creative power of uh, the individual, by, uh, the, through the creative power of a free economy that tells people that they can realize their potential through the ownership of property, through, uh, a, through um, entrepreneurship, through education that's aligned to, that is aligned to the labor market, through a government that gets out of the way so that they can move forward and succeed. That is our vision. And that is why Canada has been a magnet for risk takers and hard workers, entrepreneurs and newcomers for generations. But I, many of us are here this weekend because I think we are, we are concerned that we are losing that spirit with governments in Ottawa and Edmonton and elsewhere who are going back to these old themes of the politics of envy. And so friends, I'm here to tell you another story about uh, how we've launched a campaign for change in Alberta. I spoke here at this conference a year ago. At that time, we uh, had two conservative parties in Alberta, progressive conservatives, Wild Rose Party, splitting the support of free enterprise Albertans right down the middle, and an unpopular NDP government doing deep damage to our economy, massive increases in taxation and regulation, scaring away tens of billions of dollars of investment. In fact, uh, uh, it, uh, all of that leading to one of the longest and deepest recessions in Alberta's history, uh, turning Alberta from the engine of job creation and economic growth in Canada into the province with the highest unemployment outside of Atlantic Canada. And I spoke here a year ago about a plan, a five-step plan to reunite the divided conservative movement on the basis of our common sense values. First, we had to get the Progressive Conservative Party to buy into the idea of unity. We did that through ni a nine-month leadership campaign and ultimately got 75% of the vote, even though they did everything they could in the establishment to stop us. And then we, uh, I, my, uh, my friend and colleague Brian Jean and I sat down and negotiated a, a sensible unity agreement that was, as Shannon said, endorsed by 95% of our members. Remarkable. And then I was honored to receive uh, the support of 62% of, of our members in our leadership election for the new United Conservative Party and then election to the legislature a year ago. We seemed to be hopelessly divided. We were giving the New Democrats exactly what they wanted, a vote split. They couldn't believe their good fortune. It's how they won the last election. And they thought we were too venal, too short-sighted, too partisan to put aside our differences. But we did it in Alberta. We said, yes, there are differences of approach and, and emphasis between the PCs and Wild Roses, just like there were back in the day at the federal level between progressive conservatives and reformers. But we said the future of Alberta, as the beating heart of free enterprise values in Canada, was too important to risk because of egos or resentments or partisanship. And we put the future of the province and, more importantly, her people ahead of any partisan interest. And now the United Conservative Party of Alberta is the largest provincial political party and the most popular political party in Canada. So... I say that partly as a word of encouragement for you conservatives, pour conservateurs dans toutes les coins du Canada, 
And that's for all the conservative in everywhere in the country, because I do know that it is a time where we have a lot of challenges uh, for conservatives in several places in Canada, especially in the Atlantic provinces, in Quebec, and also in Ontario right now. However, if you work hard, if you you keep your convictions and you continue to defend your principles and if you are uh, able to unify people around your approach and if we continue our efforts to get closer uh, to Canadians who share our values, there will be a future for a, a pro-enterprise and conservative government in all corners of Canada. I'm saying... I guess we don't have trans simultaneous here translation, no? Uh, I'm saying that, that, that I hope our experience in Alberta, by the way, we're not there yet, 16 months to go before the next election. But as I say to our supporters every day, if we work hard, stay humble, and earn every vote, we will ensure that this job-killing, tax-increasing, debt-quadrupling, socialist, ex accidental government in Alberta is one and done. <laughs> And the message, the message is for conservatives in every part of the country. I know it's a uh, tough time in many parts. You see uh, my friend Michael from New Yukon here. Great Yukon government. Premier Peslowski, unfortunately, narrowly lost after a long time in government uh, to tax-raising liberals. A difficult time in the Atlantic provinces for conservatives. They, and, of course, here in Ontario, uh, challenging days. But never lose heart because ours is the tradition that founded Canada. It, it, the, can, the vision of confederation came from one of the great Canadian conservatives, uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, and I'll tell you, I'll never apologize for him having been the father of this party, of this movement, of this country. As long as we work hard and stay humble and always reach out and renew uh, our, our movement so that it, it is true to our convictions but relevant to the concrete challenges that people face in their everyday lives. Because ordinary Canadians, they're not looking for political leadership that's obsessed with ideology and labels. That's why I never referred to our movement in Alberta as Unite the Right. Uh, I, I, I said it was an effort to unite our, the, our province on the basis of our traditional belief in, in freedom. But we always need to reach out, and that is a critical uh, lesson of our recent history. Shannon mentioned that for several years, I worked uh, with, uh, alongside Stephen Harper and our federal team to reach out to new Canadians. Had we not done so, in a very deliberate way, we never would have won the majority in 2011, perhaps not even the minorities of 06 and 08. Canada's demography is changing. How is it changing? It's changing because every year hundreds of thousands of newcomers arrive here who are Canadians by choice and not chance. They aren't like people like myself. I, I won the lottery by being born in the best country in the world. These are folks who have made the entrepreneurial decision to take a risk, to leave behind family and friends and what's familiar, and very often to leave behind being an amongst the most prosperous people in their, and best educated people in their countries of origin to take a chance on this often strange and cold country uh, with all of the challenges that that implies. And, and, and those challenges sometimes are profound. I look at my friend Eli here who came uh, to Canada from Sudan and who went to Lakehead University, uh, to Laurentian University and got his education and worked hard and embraced Canada because he knew it was a land of opportunity. He understood the promise of Canada, that if you come here, work hard and play by the rules, that the sky is the limit, not just for you, but for your children. And now he is a hugely successful entrepreneur. Not only does Eli employ 17 people in three offices, many of themselves new Canadians, but I think I've ho I hope I've talked him into becoming a United Conservative MLA in the next legislature. <laughs> and Eli, for me, personifies the 
uh, Ali personifies the what I'm talking about, this, this aspiration that drives people to come to this country and become Canadian. These uh, new C Canadians are deeply, intuitively conservative in their values. They believe in the virtue of hard work. They believe, they, they want a country where uh, you, work, hard work will be translated into success. So many people come to this country from corrupt socialist or uh, dysfunctional societies and they just want a chance to work hard. They don't support high burdensome confiscatory taxation or regulation or red tape. They want economic freedom. And uh, so many people like Ali come from countries where, uh, cultures where they value uh, the importance of civil society, of, the, the, of family as the basic institution of society. They believe that the family is the most, as Aristotle taught us, is the basic and most important institution in society, not a huge bureaucratic state. Right? And mo most new Canadians that I know I believe in, 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 in freedom. Many have been victims of, of persecution, of, of violence, of, of, of conflict uh, because of their faith or their ethnicity. And here they want to be able to practice their faith and live out their convictions. They, they, they believe in uh, parental authority and the that parents are the primary and most important educators of their children and are not the state. And believe in values like freedom of conscience and religion that are now increasingly under attack in our society, including by the Trudeau government. And so there is a natural and deep alignment between our values and those of most new Canadians. But for far too long, we didn't communicate those shared values. We just, just didn't even try. You know, Woody Allen, the direct U.S., the American uh, film director, once said that 90% of success in life is just showing up. Well, we as conservatives need to learn and relearn and relearn again that message that we need to show up amongst our fellow Canadians, many of whom are struggling to overcome the challenges of integration. Too often and too easily, our partisan foes do that even though they are not, do not share the values, the aspirational values of new newcomers. So this, but the, by the way, what I'm talking about isn't really new to the idea of Canadian conservatism. It is who we are. Um, in the deep conservative tradition, it was the greatest, many of the greatest champions of human dignity and opportunity in modern history have been conservatives. I think of my, one of my great heroes, William Wilberforce, the great emancipator. I'm glad some of you know who he was. But he was the great liberator whose persistent 30-year campaign led to the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. And uh, he, he was the personification of conviction in politics, of speaking truth to power. I think of Benjamin Disraeli, the father of what's known as One Nation Conservatism in Britain, the idea that we should be the party of opportunity for all including those at the margins. And I think of our own Canadian tradition. I think of uh, Robert Borden, who extended the franchise to women uh, in, in Canada. Or John Diefenbaker, the great, late, right honorable John Diefenbaker, who extended the franchise to Aboriginal Canadians, who brought in our first ever uh, statutory protection for minority rights in his Bill of Rights, who appointed the first... <laughs> who appointed the first women uh, to a Canadian cabinet ministry, Ellen Fairclaw, who as Minister of Citizenship and Immigration in 1960 eliminated racial and country of origin discrimination from our immigration system. That is the Canadian conservative tradition of which we should all be proud. And I will not accept, I will not accept our partisan adversaries mischaracterizing the hearts of conservative Canadians of this movement, of this tradition. It was the conservatives who elected the first Canadian of non-European origin to the Parliament of Canada, uh, the young Douglas Jung in Van Vancouver Centre in 1957. 
When he grew up, Douglas Jung wasn't, able to, wasn't allowed to go into some government buildings or swimming pools in Vancouver, if you can believe it. He wasn't even considered a citizen and didn't have the right to vote. But he was so patriotic. He believed, in notwithstanding our imperfections, he believed so much in the promise of Canada that he was willing to lay down his life for our country. And so when, the, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, you know, he led a, a group of, of Canadians of Chinese origin down to the Army Recruitment Office on Burrard Street in Vancouver, and they sought to enlist in the Canadian Army that wouldn't take them because they were Chinese. And, but I'll tell you something, they, 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 they wouldn't give up. They went back to the recruitment center over and over again, week after week. Douglas Jung and his growing number of patriotic Canadians of Chinese origin didn't have the right to vote, but they wanted the right to die for their country. And finally, by the end of the war, the, gov the Dominion government had to relent, enlisted them. Douglas and his, many of his comrades became special operators, dropped behind em enemy lines to help in the liberation of Manchuria. And when he came back to Canada in 1945 as a war hero, Canada could no longer say no to him or the Chinese community. Full citizenship was granted, and he went on to become the first Canadian of Asian origin elected to the Parliament of Canada as a proud Conservative. <laughs> Where I think of... I think of another one of our role models, the great, late, honorable Lincoln Alexander, the, who was the son of a, of a railway porter, grew up in a poor family in Hamilton, and went on to become the first ever black Canadian member of parliament and minister and then lieutenant governor, and he was a proud Canadian conservative. It was conservatives. Who attract, who, it was a conservative government that appointed the first Canadian of Eastern European origin, Michael Starkovitz, to a federal cabinet, who elected the first Canadian of Japanese origin to the Parliament of Canada, who appointed the first Inuit Canadian, uh, Leona, our dear friend Leona Aglukak, to a senior federal cabinet position, who uh, brought in the, who, who appointed the first, Stephen Harper, who appointed the first uh, Canadian of Korean, of Vietnamese, of Pakistani origin to the Senate of Canada. It was conservatives, reform conservatives, who elected the first Muslim Canadian member of Parliament, the first Hindu Canadian member of Parliament, the first Indo Canadian woman of uh, Parliament. It was Stephen Harper's 2011 caucus that was the most diverse government caucus in Canadian parliamentary history. It was Brian Mulroney who tripled immigration levels over those of Pierre Trudeau. Boy, that, they don't teach you that in school, do they? It was Brian Mulroney's conservative government that uh, expressed apologies for the mistreatment of Japanese Canadians with the internment and Italian Canadians during the inter their internment in the Second World War. And Stephen Harper, who recognized the injustice of the Chinese head tax of Aboriginal residential schools. Of, uh, and all of these things were done. This conservative tradition is the tradition of human dignity, of equality of opportunity, of people of all backgrounds, and we must demonstrate that to our fellow Canadians, especially the newest Canadians, deliberately and every day. And in so doing, as we try to renew this movement so that the idea of or the, the great idea of ordered liberty is relevant to future generations, we have to be mindful of, of po contemporary political threats and challenges that exist. I see two on the horizon that we must avoid. On the one side, there is always the comfortable siren call of going along to get along, of a conservative party that's just a slightly more pro-enterprise, pale version of the liberals. And I, but I believe... I think it was that Dr. Roy. <laughs> Love Dr. Roy. Um, you know, that is an idea that has never resulted. By the way, people always argue for that pragmatically. If we're just more like the liberals, somehow we're going to get elected. Why would people vote for a phony version of squishy, meaningless, opportunistic, power-hungry liberalism? They never will. They never did. Voter 
voters want and they deserve to have a choice and not an echo. And we must always be that choice rooted in our values and our convictions. And that means that we must be bold. Our provincial parties, our federal party, our think tanks, our activist organizations, our, our individual members, we must be bold in proposing reforms and solutions that are relevant to the challenges of today. No party of any persuasion uh, is, is, worth it, is worth supporting if it just continues to repeat solutions to the problems of decades ago. We have an aging population. We need conservative parties that have the courage to speak to the need for health care reform that is focused not on preserving the entitlements and, and benefits of special interests and government unions, but is focused on patients because access to a waiting list is not access to health care. At the provincial level, I believe we must be bold in embracing, as we've done in Alberta, uh, the, the principle of parental authority and, and the, the dynamic value of competition in the education system through school choice rather than state monopolies. In regulatory reform, uh, we, we must be prepared to break down huge monopolies that cost consumers and constrain innovation. In foreign policy, we must be prepared to be a party of principle and conviction, even if sometimes it is not convenient or easy. On all of these issues, we should be at the cutting edge of, of public debate, not not seeking the comfortable position of triangulating the differences in the population. That cynicism is always rejected by voters. And so, friends, let us be bold and optimistic. Let us avoid that, uh, ten that temptation to simply be a, uh, an echo of the liberals. But at the same time, we must be wary and attention, have a, pay attention to another and perhaps more serious threat for conservative movements and parties around the Western world today. And that is the angry and sometimes seductive voice of a kind of demagogic uh, and xenophobic populism. That <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I believe that in their, our movement there is and must be room for a healthy happy, friendly kind of populism that, that uh, has confidence in the common sense of common people, that, that empowers ordinary people to make decisions, not just in their own lives, but yes, in our de democratic life together. Uh, that a, a, kind of, a kind of winsome populism that understands that, you know, sometimes, as William F. Buckley Jr. said, uh, that, that, uh, that understands that as he said that the first, I'd rather be governed by the first thousand people listed in the Boston phone directory than by the faculty of Harvard University. <laughs> so uh, 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 that's the kind of conservative, but we must, uh, we see in Europe, in the United States, perhaps sometimes here in Canada, voices of division that seek to drive wedges between Canadians for political purposes that seek to identify scapegoats to blame for economic stagnation or other social problems. That kind of angry, divisive populism is poison, and we must always be careful to root that out of our movement and ensure that this is a movement of openness, of inclusion, of unity and diversity, the movement of equality of opportunity and human dignity. That must be the conservative movement in Canada. Let me begin by wrapping up. I just wanted to say something very relevant to my home province, but I think all of us as Canadians, because we talk about our tradition being that of, of enterprise, of economic growth and opportunity. Well, right now, the biggest engine of, jo of uh, jobs, of, of economic opportunity, of wealth creation in our country is under serious attack. And I'm talking about Canada's energy industry. The oil and gas industry that for much of the past 25 years has been year after year the largest creator of not just jobs but high paying jobs of any industry 
in the country. It has helped to keep Canada afloat during the due 2008 global crisis and the years that followed it. That helped to keep public treasuries filled uh, right across the country and employ people not just in Alberta and Saskatchewan, also BC and in Manitoba, but in every part of the country, the suppliers in Quebec and Ontario, the laborers from eastern Canada, from the east coast that moved to the west, from unemployment to pursue the dignity of a job. This industry has helped to raise countless Canadians up from despair to hope and opportunity. As one of my favorite guys, Rex Murphy, points out all the time, his native Newfoundlanders who were left stranded after the death of the cod fishery Communities that were disappearing, hopelessness and dependency, and something appeared on the horizon. The oil and gas industry in Newfoundland and Labrador and in Alberta and Saskatchewan, which helped so many of them to start again, which is the Canadian story. But that, that industry, that engine of our prosperity, is under massive attack. And it's not just some coincidence that this is happening. This is a deliberate, coordinated strategy. Uh, organizations, well-funded, many of them foreign-funded, that decided collectively several years ago that they were going to target Canada's energy industry as part of their broader strategy. Because, you know why? We, here we are. We have the third largest uh, oil, recoverable oil reserves in the world. Um, 172, let me just check, 172 million, uh, a billion, what am I saying? 172 billion barrels of discovered oil by 2015. Now, if you want to put a notional market value on that, if we were getting the fair market price right now, roughly $60 a barrel, we're talking about north of $10 trillion. Now, friends, just think about this. You see developed uh, countries like Greece and others in southern Europe and around the world who are teetering on bankruptcy, who cannot pay their debts, who can't honor the promises of their pensions or public health care programs. Um, and you, we have some of the same challenges with an aging population, the demographic change, over a trillion dollars of public debt and unfunded liabilities, according to the Fraser Institute. If we want to be able to guarantee to the young people here not just a quality education, and a strong economy with good jobs in the future. But also someday, some support in their retirement, with, with uh, retirement security, with reliable health care. If we want to be able to assure these things to the Canadian people, then we must be able to access uh, this, some of the $10 trillion of value that lies in this country, one of the great blessings of nature that we have inherited, the third largest oil reserves in the world. But Justin Trudeau says, let's phase out the oil sands. And two days ago, announced a new policy that I believe will make it impossible to get approval for a major pipeline in this country ever in the future under these new rules, which say that provinces must have a cap on their production of oil and gas. Guess, guess which province he's thinking about. By the way, en passant, je crois que M. Trudeau... Ne in passing, I don't think Mr. Trudeau would ever say that there was a cap on the number of planes that Bombardier builds, would he? Um, but I'll tell you something. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Saudi Arabia, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Qatar, the Socialist Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, or any of the major... Uh, oil and gas countries in the world will put a cap on their production, will stop building pipelines, will refuse to market, to sell their resources to the rest of the world. This coordinated attack, now being led by an anti-development NDP Green government in British Columbia, with the support of a huge array of well-funded foreign interest groups, has targeted Canada for one reason only, because they believe that we are the Boy Scouts amongst global resource countries. They know they cannot affect the policy direction of the Saudis, of the Venezuelans, of Nigeria, of other major oil producers. And they hope and believe that this country will be naive enough 
to fold under political pressure and to leave in the ground $10 trillion of wealth, which, which represents untold opportunity to raise up living standards, not just for those who live in Canada today, but those who are yet to be born and the generations of immigrants yet to become. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not just an economic issue. It is a moral issue. We cannot responsibly leave a monopoly to global energy markets to some of the world's worst regimes, dictatorships, and kleptocracies. We need Canadian oil as part of the global energy solution. And that does not mean, and that does not mean for a moment that we should be environmentally irresponsible. To the con contrary, Canada has the highest environmental standards of any major oil and gas producer in the world, the highest human rights and labor standards. I call on our uh, fellow Canadians on the left to be truly and courageously progressive, to say that the world needs oil, more, for, more oil from Canada and less from regimes like Saudi Arabia. And while I'm at it, I promise I'll wrap here. While I'm at it, let me just say, let me just say, this whole notion that we can buy this phony social license with, with, by, by punishing consumers with confiscatory taxes is now compl a complete shambles. As they say in Britain, it's shambolic. You know, uh, my premier, a very committed, capable, thoughtful uh, individual, Rachel Notley, told us, she absolutely is, and I respect her in every way. I just think she's, I think she and the NDP, they're good people. They just have very bad ideas. And that's, and by the way, that's a message for all of us. When I talked about the danger of negative populism, you know, I believe one of the reasons we lost the last election federally is because we made it too easy for our opponents to depict us as the nasty party. And it is time for us to demonstrate, even if sometimes it hurts, it is time for us to demonstrate respect, and to be happy warriors, and to understand that those with whom we disagree are not bad people, we just disagree with their... Let's beat them at the level of ideas, not by, not by the politics of personal destruction. So... So, Rachel, so Premier Notley came out with this uh, carbon tax idea. And she told us that if we made it more expensive for widows to heat their homes when it's 40 below outside, or for people to take their pickup to work when they have no option, or for farmers to plow their fields, that somehow all of these activist organizations would, would stop their obstructionism would suddenly go from opposition to pipelines and resources to support. Well, guess what's happened since then? Justin Trudeau came out and vetoed the Northern Gateway Pipeline arbitrarily. And then Barack Obama, who praised the NDP carbon tax, came out and vetoed the Keystone XL Pipeline. And then the National Energy Board, at the prompting of the Fed Trudeau Liberals, effectively killed the Energy East Pipeline route and with it the dream of energy independence, a $16 billion investment that, that, it, that means that Eastern Canadians continue to import oil from the Venezuelan dictatorship rather than Canada uh, supporting fellow Canadians. And now, and now we have the British Columbia government that's doing everything that it can do to block Kinder Morgan. I'm sorry, Premier, but your social license is a sham. It's time to repeal the carbon tax. And so I just want to say how, for, for those of you who are from Ontario, how happy I am that you have three leadership co uh, contestants who are listening to the members and Ontarians on this issue rather than just the elites. And for those of you who are skeptical, I know we had a debate on the stage about carbon taxes not long ago, but let's be absolutely clear about this. I'm sure Michael Bingen's pointed this out, that the advocates of carbon taxes say that for carbon taxes to achieve uh, Paris climate targets would require a price of at least $200 uh, per ton. The Trudeau tax is $50 a ton. This isn't about Paris. It's not about climate change. It's about political theater. 
the same kind of cynical political theater of the Kretschmann government that committed to some of the world's most ambitious Kyoto targets, but, but instead of reducing emissions by 7%, oversaw a 30% increase. I'm sorry, the solution is not punishing consumers and making the cost of living even higher. The solution isn't energy poverty. The solution is not the deindustrialization of the Canadian economy. The solution certainly is not shutting down that great engine of opportunity that exists in the northern Alberta oil sands. The solution will be found in a million different uh, innovations of, through research and development. And let me say, Prime Minister, when you went to Davos and claimed that Canada should be known for its resourcefulness rather than its resources, you missed the point. There is no industry in Canada that is more resourceful, that invests more in research and development and applied science and technology than Canada's energy industry. Let's support that innovation to reduce the environmental footprint. I'm sorry, I get cranked up about this, so I... This matters. This matters. No, 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 less, less, less. This really matters. And by the way, I'll just one last point, and then I'll wrap. I swear, promise, promise. One more point. This is not... I'm not here doing special pleading for my province. I am a proud Canadian. Et je sais que le Québec a profité de richesse. I know that Quebec has... To being able to take advantage of wealth in the West and the industry and the energy industry in the West. Over $200 billion net through the system of equalization. And Albertans, I assure you, don't begrudge that. We are generous and fair-minded people. When times are good in our province and they are bad elsewhere, we are fine with sharing some of our wealth with the rest of the country. But don't tell me that you'll take the equalization checks while fighting the pipelines and refusing to build the industry that creates the wealth in the first place. You know, my buddy Brad Wall said perhaps the only way we could get Denis Coderre, the former mayor of Montreal, to accept uh, the uh, Energy East pipeline is if we were to ship equalization checks through it. So I, <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but he's now the former mayor. <laughs> On to cut. And so I close by saying that this is in, this is not just in the national interest, this is existential for us as Canadians right now. All right, and we need to build a cross-partisan coalition of Canadians who understand uh, that this is the fight of our generation. When we talk about everything, all the social issues, health care and education, when we talk about income security, pensions and seniors, when we talk about infrastructure and higher education and innovation, all, none of these things we will be able to afford unless we uh, develop some of this extraordinary wealth that we have been blessed with. Any other country in the world would would dream of having this kind of wealth that we now seem to be willing to, to turn our backs on. So, friends, this is about, this is about opportunity for uh, generations yet unborn. This is about the future of Canada. Will we continue to be one of the most prosperous countries in the world with one of the highest standards of living, or will we end up following the path of Argentina, which was an economy identical to Canada's 70 years ago. I talked about Saskatchewan versus Alberta. Well, Argentina versus Canada is another historic comparison of the devastating effect of the politics of, uh, of uh, resentment and populism destroying an economy for decades. We cannot let that be repeated in Canada, and I know with your support we will not. And so let me close with the word of optimism by saying that... Uh, when I look at the young people here today, that makes me feel optimistic. When I see the quality of the ideas being discussed today, that makes me optimistic. When I see our bright, young, energetic leader of our national movement, Andrew Scheer, I'll tell you, his uh, energy, his idealism makes me optimistic to be a conservative. And so, uh, motivated by that sense of optimism, of a, be a belief in our tradition, the best that it offers to Canada, all that we have contributed, uh, let us work, move forward together towards the next federal election, towards all of the challenges that lie ahead. And let us do so 
inspired by the words of one of our great conservative leaders, John Diefenbaker, who said that I am a Canadian, free to speak without fear, free to worship in my own way, free to stand for what I think right, free to oppose what I believe wrong, or free to choose those who will govern my country. This heritage of freedom I pledge to uphold for myself and for all mankind. This is our heritage of freedom, ladies and gentlemen. Let us together pledge to uphold it. God bless you. God bless Canada. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.